an on, but I'm delighted to say, as promised, we're joined in studio by Jamie Wall. Good morning to you, Jamie. Hey, Jordan, how are you? Very good. Thanks, million for coming into us. Thanks, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, we've you've been working with some of these lads up close and personal, so we'll get your thoughts on that in a minute. But it did strike me with the two matchups that we had, and reading a good few of the previews, that um, there doesn't hasn't been a huge amount of tactical breakdown necessarily. These two teams, uh, these four teams, really. There's been some conversation over the last few years about maybe tactical advances in the game, like Waterford would have been a good example of a team that would have sort of worked in that way, but it seems as if tactics is not necessarily a key for these four teams the weekend, that it's maybe more about matchups and physicality and that sort of stuff. Yeah, maybe, I suppose, like, uh, something, I think, I suppose, just because it's so outwardly obvious, I suppose, when you're talking about Wexford, Watford, Clare under Davy Fitz, mm. because positions had actually were changed around and stuff, you know, kind of, you think, oh, that's a tactic and stuff, but I suppose the kind of the kernel of the tactics now at use is kind of the way the four teams that we're talking about are using the ball. Like, and in particular, in the case of Cork, Limerick, and Clare, it's quite similar. They the three of them kind of play a quite a similar game. They would have similar players. I think Limerick obviously will be the most physical of of those three mentioned. Um, whereas Galway would have a slightly more direct style, just based again, I suppose, personnel based, based on the fact that you know they have like there was that that the rugby team comment that was misinterpreted I think during the week like I think it was just a case of that they are quite like nobody said they weren't well able to hurl but they are quite quite physical men you know like Johnny Glynn Joe Canning um, even some of their you know some of their tie hurlers are actually quite quite strong men you know just so I suppose that kind of style it, it lends itself to to going that bit more direct I suppose and but like yeah. <coughs> I certainly think it's not anything those four teams are doing isn't happening by accident like so while we may we're not maybe focusing on the tactics because they're not as outwardly obvious um i think definitely you know they are going to play a major part in in, in the two games you know between the yeah. four teams when you when you talk about the use of the ball and the physicality is that one of the keys for that uh glare galway game in some respects that Clare are not the physical team that Galway are and actually keeping the ball on the move on a fairly regular basis it might be sort of key for them yeah it's paramount really for Clare yeah. if, if they're to give themselves any chance and I am giving Clare a chance I think look I've had, I've had a couple of arguments with people about it um, yeah they still have one or two things we'll say issues and I think you know they might struggle in midfield um, you know with, with the Galway midfield of, of David Burke and Johnny Cohn but um I think if Clare can can use the ball correctly, you know, like get get Podge into the game, get Tony Kelly into the game. I think when the two of them play well and seem to be at it, Clare are really at it. You know, when they can use them and get them using the ball in the right way, I think you know, obviously they've had a very solid kind of plan B in terms of going long on top of John Conlon because he's so strong. It'll be interesting to see if they actually go with that. Um, given that it'll be Dahi Burke he'll be going up against who's probably you know the most physically capable of handling him you know will they maybe try and move him somewhere to try and get a, a better matchup and maybe put some, someone like Shane O'Donnell on Dahi Burke and see can they run him you know I, I don't know how do Galway respond to that they don't just move Dahi Burke around after Conlon do they given that I mean Brendan Bugler has described both of them in the paper this morning is the best pound for pound hurlers in the country. Um well up there, yeah. I mean, he yeah, well up there. At the moment anyway in current form, definitely he wouldn't be wouldn't be too far wrong with that. It'd be interesting to see what Galway would do if Claire asked the question of them and tried to move them around in that sense. Um I think Galway would probably try and just keep their shape and, and stay that bit more rigid with we'll say Dahi Burke and, and Gerard McInerney in the middle of the defence. Um but I suppose you know, the flip side of that for Clare is, I suppose, do they want to go away from what has generally been working reasonably well for them and are they just going to back their man and just say, yeah, no, look, John, you know, let's have a go at him. Kind of, you know, the way Kilkenny maybe back in the day used to kind of give, we'll say, and it's something I expect Galway to actually do against Clare, but, um, you know, it's something that, we'll say, Kilkenny used to do where Henry Shefflin would go on to the debutante for a while, you know, we'll say he'd be whoever be considered a soft touch and try and break him. Right. And then he'd get a fifteen minute spell on on the big player in the other team's defence and they'd kinda of alternate that right. and you know, I think the Kerry lads used to talk about hammering the hammer, like something mm. similar to that. So it'll be interesting to see what Claire do in terms of will they just try and actually go at the high work with that or will they try and say, right, you know, let's just try and take him out of the game, let's put somebody you know that bit quicker more mobile on him and try and move him around and see can we drag him away from that square where we might get a bit of joy so it'll be interesting like I said look we haven't talked a whole pile about the tactical side of, of Saturday and Sunday but I think it's actually something that's going to be quite interesting because it's not the obvious tactics you know it's the actual the kind of slightly more subtle nuanced kind of things of you know who are they going to move where are they going to do you know slightly are they going to move a guy 
you know, one position and move another guy one position and actually see is that going to make the difference. Can I just you know? ask you on that, just on that Conlon, uh, Burke one specifically, how does that, how does that work? So, like, goal management's down in the goal, right, uh, you're on Conlon for the day, and that's what we want you to do, player management are sitting down and going, right, John, we need you, move, like, pulling out to the wing, we're going to push somebody else in, so, like, how, I, I presume, like, everybody's covered all eventualities, if he goes, goes out here, you're going after him, or you're not going after him, or whatever it is. Something has to kind of give, I suppose, like, like from our own perspective, we'll say, when we're going through that, you obviously try to keep some bit of semblance of shape, you know, in your back line, and so that generally is your three and your six, like, barring... So, so the value might be that... Leave, actually leaving Burke there, forget about going after Conlon. I, I would imagine that's what, that would be their first instinct anyway. And then you'd be looking at, is Conlon causing us troubles wherever he's yeah, gone? Okay. Do you know, I think, I think it just in terms of when you're setting up a team, like you kind of, even when you're setting up your team at the start of the year, will say you don't want your centre back to be, you know, you want, if you've got a centre back who you say, right, he's going to be my man really to go putting out fires. You don't really want him to be your centre back because if you need him to go and put out a fire somewhere, then then your whole defence almost has to be reorganised around that. So you try to maybe get those guys at five and seven or two and four right. so that you kind of have that leash that you can say, right, if he's either wing, either side, you can actually just follow him. Like When it's a central player, you have that bit less leash. And that's why I think it'll be interesting to see if Clare try and actually ask a question there tactically because obviously forwards are, are that bit more fluid in their movement anyway, you know? Mm. The thing is, though, if uh, Donald Maloney and Jerry O'Connor are picking out any of the Galway backs that they want to mark John Conlon, they can't really find a weak link. No. <laughs> yeah, well, that's true. No, I suppose you can't find a weak link in terms of defensively, absolutely not. But I suppose in terms of just like trying to match up physically, you might say, right, let's get John on to, we'll say, maybe Adrian Tui, who would be more suited to marking a Podge Collins or, sure. or to marking a Shane O'Donnell, I suppose. And it's just going to be a case of, you know, if they put Shane O'Donnell at, at 14, um, where he's quite accomplished as well, you know, and maybe put John Conlon out into one of the two corners, like, are they going to say, right, who's going to actually, are we going to put Dahi out there and potentially weaken the centre of our defence, you know, um, when he's been such a linchpin there. So I suppose it's just, it is a case, look, like Gal Galway aren't, look, it's not like Galway are, are going to be looking at, at anyone that they're looking, Bar, Bar probably, Adrian Tuohy, who's not who's not a small man, like, but he's not physically just at the same level as John Conlon. But bar him, realistically, all the other five of their backs are physically more than capable of handling anyone. So it's just like I said, I suppose, it, like we said at the start, like, it's going to be because of how clear they're going to use the ball and as far as how they're going to use their setup. Um, you know, how are they going to set up in terms of is Tony Kelly going to play centre forward? Or is he going to play wing forward? Is he going to? Are they going to try and get him onto Gerard McInerney and see? Can they get a bit of joy off him in terms of the separation that obviously look Giroud kind of minds the space like a centre back kind of tends to do in hurling? He's very simple with the ball, just moves it right and left, you know, economical we'll say. Um are Claire gonna say, right, let's try and get Tony five, ten yards off him. Tony is obviously gonna shoot, he always he you know, he always takes five, six, seven shots a game. And in case of, are we going to try and get him into shooting position and see, can he pick off them four or five points? Because if his radar is on and if he's getting that separation with Gerard McInerney, then there's a huge chance that he could pick off five, six, seven scores in the game. You know, like, like he's played badly in games and you're looking, not, not badly, but he hasn't played to what you would expect a level of him. And then you go back and you look at this thing and you're like, right, Tony Kelly is five points from play, six mm. points from play. He wasn't as, as anonymous as I thought, but he does tend to kind of drift in and out of games, but all of a sudden he does so much damage in them two, three minute spells that he's in the game, you know, so I suppose it's just going to be a case of can they get that separation between him and whoever he's on that, and then if he gets that space, is the radar going to be on? Because if it is, then I think, you know, it's a case of get him on as much ball yeah. as you possibly can and, and give him that leash to go. We did wonder about Galway at the start of the year and how they'd sort of react to being champions, how easily or not that uh, crown yeah. would sit. And they obviously had a little bit of a scare against uh, Kilkenny earlier in the year, but I mean, it seems to be sitting easily enough. Uh, having said all that, you're, from, you were hinting a bit earlier on, maybe you're leaning the other direction either this um, weekend? I'm, I'm giving Clare a chance, yeah, I am giving them a chance. I'm, I'm Look, I, I'd be a fool to go and say that I think they're going to beat Galway like because Galway are capable of cutting loose at any stage. But, and, and I think the crown has rested... Res reasonably easy on Galway's head. Um I think what's helped them massively is being in Division One B and under the current you know, under the current setup, I don't know why you'd be in such a rush to be in one A. Mm. Um because as it stands, you know, Galway got to build things up nice and easy, uh, you know, and peak at the right time. And especially with the current ridiculous system where you've got league quarterfinals where the fourth team in one B 
like technically the tenth ranked team in the country is in the top eight in the league. Um, it's kind of ludicrous. Like so, under that current system, I I see no reason why you wouldn't be happy enough to plot away in the league, especially Avoid the ferociousness. Exactly, yeah. especially under the new championship where you've got that bit of time to get things going. Anyway, you know, um, it's not like Galway need to be hopping off the ground when they play their first round of the Leinster Championship. Realistically, they they know they're going to comfortably in the top three, be in the top three in Leinster. So, I think it's lended itself, and I think they've got a very good strength and conditioning coach, and they've kind of you know they've planned their run to be hitting a good a good spell at this time of year. So it's just going to be interesting in, in terms of where they are, you know, I think they have been relatively low key up to now. So it's just going to be interesting to see how, how kind of how have they timed that exactly like we're saying and that they're ready for a big burst in over two games. Whereas Clare and all the rest of the teams in Munster have had to peak on a number of occasions yeah. just to get out of Munster, you know? Well that's been one of the the conversations as well had around the other game in Cork versus Limerick this week as well. Donald O'Mahony talking mm. uh, about John Myler learning a thing or two from David in terms of the week to week basis, in terms of, you know, going from Premier League where at the end of every game, no matter how big it is, the manager comes in and says, Right, that game's done, on to yeah. the next one. And apparently John Myler has been doing a lot of that this year. He's kind of tapped into that mindset. Yeah, well you, well they've had to like, you know, and you have to kind of, you know, learn or die kind of pretty quick in Munster. I mean like I know just you know personally like I met one or two of the Limerick lads after um after they they lost that game to Clare in Cusick Park and they were obviously deflated after kind of the defeat like and I was kind of just you know kind of trying to temper it just by saying look the bottom line is the top the second best team in the country last year and the third best team in the country last year are both out now while you're gone through in the top 3 so look yeah It'd be nice to be in Ulster final, but that's not the be all and end all anymore. It is that, yeah. you know, it's that mindset now. I think, and we're moving towards that mindset of getting into the top three, you know, and I think it hasn't devalued the provincial championships as such in terms of as a championship as a whole. I think it's definitely actually almost mo made it more valuable in the sense that there's no second chance now from Munster. You know, you either get out of Munster or you don't. But in a sense, maybe it's devalued that final, that, you know, that terms of the actual winning, winning of it right. is less important than qualifying from it. And I think, you know, that mindset, you know, of, you know, week to week, you know, move it on, it's a league, just get on with it now, you know, kind of that just, and in terms of as well, what training you can do in that spell, you know, like realistically, like you can do very, very little. So you have to get your work done kind of, so that all those soccer elements of kind of the pre-season and then for most of the season, you're just ticking over bar one or two breaks. You know, if you've got maybe an international break where you can do a bit of work with guys, the same. Cork have had know, a break. Cork, have, Cork got their break from this. So, and again, so that's, an in, that's another interesting element to it because it'll be interesting to see, you know, have Cork benefited from getting the five week kind of break um, or would the fact that mm. you know Limerick got they got two I think they got a week off, played one of the Joe McDonough teams, um, played Carlo, um, then got two weeks off was it or one week off played Kilkenny and two weeks off now to play Cork like perfect is that the perfect running I suppose and that's what we're going to find out this weekend because we've got two teams that had a break against two teams that went through you know kind of getting the slew of games two games little break go you know so it's just it's going to be very interesting to see you know like bar look Cork 2005 Tip 2016 they're the last two teams in the last 20 years to win the Munster Championship and win the All-Ireland in the same year so obviously something was broken so it will be interesting to see is if this year you know is it you know is it now beneficial to win the Munster Championship you know so like it's probably a case of it strikes me looking at the football championship and obviously the different format that we've had there and that turnaround that we've just been discussing of sort of games week on week like different teams react to it differently like we've all, we've discussed it for years as a fait accompli one way or the other but actually it really suits some teams yeah. and other teams it just doesn't yeah definitely and I think uh, the teams that tend to suit are the ones that get enough cracks at it you know like mm. Kilkenny got enough cracks at, at figuring it out mm. and I think you know they. but like then the flip side of that is Kilkenny always knew as well that they didn't really have to be at top gear to win a Leinster Championship whereas to win a Munster Hurling Championship realistically like you had to be at top gear three days out before like if you if you drew the quarter final you had to be at top gear to win your first round second round and, and final Um you know, so I suppose it's very hard, like, you know, you talk to any of the guys who know a lot more about, you know, strength and conditioning and kind of getting a team to that pitch that it's quite hard to get anyone to peak twice in a year, let alone three or four times in a year, you know. So so I suppose, you know, that that side of it, um, you know, this we're talking about the formats and stuff like I think, you know, if ever it's it is a strange kind of it's a strange championship in both senses, the hurling and the football, in that we've got so many different teams 
with so many different conditions, you know, like they're living under different conditions. Like one team plays every three, four weeks, then another team plays week on week, mm. you know, and it's just kind of like, I think it's something that, you know, I was listening to the show last Monday with Michael Quinlevin and, and you're talking about, tier, we were talking about tier championships and we're talking about these kind of things that until we get a system whereby we can actually set in stone what's happening from the start of the year and not have kind of like, you know, you're trying to set up a team and at the start of the year you say, right, if we win our games, we're playing every couple of weeks. Mm. But if we lose one of our games, then we're going into a totally different championship. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's just kind of, yeah. it's a bit it's a bit strange. It's a little bit Irish, like, you know, yeah. um, just that format kind of discrepancies in the format. Like, you know. Is Harnady out? I don't know. And that's, I'm not <laughs> being, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not doing the Kerry thing now. So don't you start. Oh, it's rubbing uh, off. Don't you there, start, yeah. Yeah, five minutes beside you and I'm starting off. Um, I'm going to be tipping Limerick in a minute now. Yeah. Is it? The transformation is complete. <laughs> um, like if he's, if he's not there, um, is that, because it seems everybody can't really pick between the two of them. Certainly a lot of the pundits we've had on this week are finding it hard to pick between Cork and Limerick. If he's not there, is that the thing that swings it? Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, he'd be a huge, huge loss for a Cork if he's not there um, like he'll be a massive loss I think if he's not there it maybe gives it maybe gives them an opportunity actually to do something that, that they might have had to do anyway um, except it maybe wouldn't have been Seamus Harney losing out I think you know a move that look I don't know I think they certainly have to consider is um, is bring, putting someone else into putting someone new into the half back line and moving especially if Seamus is out like maybe putting um, Tim O'Mahony in centre-back, moving on Cadigan out to the wing, uh, moving Mark Coleman to midfield and pushing Bill Cooper up. And the reason I'm saying that is like, you know, look, I'm a huge, huge fan of Mark Coleman. I think he's I think he's just class. Like, I love the way he plays hurling. I love the way he used the ball. But last year, he struggled massively with Brick Walsh's physicality in the semi-final. And it was the only game he struggled all year in. Um, and, you know, no disrespect to Brick, but he wouldn't be, you know, he's in the twilight of his career. He wouldn't be overly mobile. Um, whereas by comparison, Limerick's two wing forwards are, you know, are um, Gerard Hegarty and Tom Morrissey, who are both very, very physical men. Like we've played against them in the Fitzgibbon with Mary I in, in UL, and, and only when you actually get up beside them, you see how how physical they are. But they can also both move. So I think physically, like I mean, look, if I was Limerick, I would be looking at at Mark Coleman and seeing an opportunity just purely based on that the two matchups they have physically are are so dominant there mm. and to see could they break Cork there look another option Cork have is that they could just swap Mark straight into centre back and bring on Cadigan and Christopher Joyce in the two wings and then you have two very physical men out there in the wings and Mark holding the middle which he's well able to do as well but I suppose for me especially if Seamus Harrandy is out I would say the best move is is Tim O'Mahony into centre back where he played so well during the league he can hold that middle and he can hurl the ball as well because Kyle Hayes is going to drop off, so there's going to be an opportunity for your centre back to play a lot of ball, um, and then get on Cadigan and Christopher Joyce on the two wings because physically they're probably bear me will maybe add Damien Callan there. They're probably the only two backs who are physical enough to deal with Gerard Hegarty and Tom Morrissey, you know. So and I think Tom Morrissey, especially Gerard Hegarty, but especially Tom Morrissey, have been massive to clear to Limerick success this mm -hmm. year. Like you know, like Tom Morrissey's probably in the running a dark horse for hurler of the year if for me like I think he's 20 to 1 at the moment I would say a good performance again at the weekend and he's a fellow who's had a massive year all year you know um, he's just been one of these guys who just constantly drives Limerick on he mm. collects ball he comes back and protects the half back line very well um, and he carries the ball out as well and, and just takes the pressure off the team a lot like he showed real leadership quality all year he was captain at under 21s last year um, and he's just a guy who's been really impressive all year. So I think it's just something, it's a worry from a Cork perspective that are Limerick going to maybe see if they can target Mark physically like, and, and then it's a case of, will they get joy off it? Look, you know, it could play into Cork's hands. Mark Holm could end up on a load of ball. But I just think it's something that they have to be looking at saying like, there's an opportunity there for Limerick because physically they have one of the biggest middle eights I've ever seen between Dermot Burns, Declan Hannon, Dan Morrissey. And the three lads, and then the two boys midfield aren't exactly small either, you know. It's an noticeable trend, isn't it? The the size of say like that half back line for Kilkenny, they're all over six foot. They're massive, like the middle eight, as you say. Yeah. Look at Galway, like it's it's starting to become a bit of a trend where 
being a, a wristy hurler is no longer a good thing. It's uh, no longer a good thing on its own. You need to be a big man as well. Like, I wonder, is this just an anomaly? So, certainly in, in certain positions, I think, you know, um, definitely, like I said, in, in that middle age, just because, like, so much of the play arrives down there, you know, um, you think about it, like, puck outs, like, if a team doesn't go short, their puck outs are going to land on the opposition half-back line, you know, probably around the opposition 45 with the main most goalies are hitting the ball like and and if they're going to go that far they're going to come down with height because they're going to have to have cleared what um, three six eight they're going to have to have cleared 16 players in the field so they're going to have to come down with a bit of with a bit of with a degree of height so having that physicality there is a massive thing you know I mean even just midfielders anymore like I mean Keane Lynch and Dara Dunham are, are both quite physical as well for Limerick so it is look that that move towards the, the physicality. You know, it's it was bound, it was inevitable to happen, really, because I suppose you know kids are even kids. You know, at, at sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, are are in gyms now. There, you know, all those things are happening. Like you know, and it's a reality. Like you know, obviously the basics of hurling are the most important thing. But I think like when you look at these teams, it's not. There's no. It's not a case of, you know, it's not a case of everyone being built like Tarzan. Um, and not being able to hurl like they are, they're well able to hurl too. It's just, it's just a by, you know, it's just a kind of a byproduct of the work that's being done over the last 10, 15 years in terms of us catching up, sports science wise, with everything that you know, physicality now is such a major part of the game as well. You know. Yeah. The, the other trend I noticed, and I know you mentioned it at the top page in terms of your familiarity with some of these lads through Mary I. It was written in the Irish Examiner this morning, which is a, a astonishing stat that more than half of all the players in the squads this weekend are either students or teachers. And like we had Matthew O'Hanlon on the show yesterday, and, and he was like uh, talking about taking time out of work this summer as well, just to focus on the hurling and give it a yeah. good old crack. It does seem that having the summers off is kind of the, the perceived wise thing to do. Yeah, thanks for that. This is my pitch now for primary school teachers, anyone doing the <laughs> CAO, lads, you know, get it in. Um, no, I, no, in fairness, look, it is like, and I think it's, it's, it is noteworthy, like, you know, the student lifestyle, you know, it lends itself to, you know, look, you're finished in May, you've got the whole summer off, and realistically, especially with the new championship now, of the four weeks, like, you know, you need that time off just for in terms of, like, not having to get up in the morning, you know, do a day's work and try to kind of drag yourself along to do something then in the evening, you know, I think, um, you know, whether it's being a teacher or whether it's whether it's being a student, like, it does lend itself to, to that, to this, to kind of this borderline semi-professional lifestyle that a lot of them seem to be living without without the kind of financial benefits, you know, and I think, but I think, like, you know, uh, we kind of get a small bit bogged down in it, you know, like, I think Jamie Barron got in hot water, you know, a couple of months ago when he said um, that he was thinking of doing teaching because, you know, one of the reasons he said was that he'd be able to go home at half three and he could have, have a nap or something before going training, and I think, and he got a bit of a slating, and I just thought it was unfair because, like, if Jamie Barron had been a farmer and he came out and said, oh, you know, I'm going to do the teaching because I can come home and I can milk the cows and I have time to milk the cows and go training, nobody would have batted an eyelid. Everyone would have just said, oh, geez, fair play to him. He's working yeah, hard. Yeah. He's, like, he's getting out of that tree. But all the of a sudden... The implication being the teachers... The implication um, just being like that, that he's nothing to do with himself. But it's just like kind of, look, you know, you can... It does, like, there's no point beating around the bush, like, that that lifestyle as a teacher or as a student, like you do have more hours in the day. Like it's not that you're not working as hard. Like you you can stay there all day if you want. Like there is plenty of work to do. But by the same token, there's plenty of opportunities to get it done. And the nights you're training, that you know you can get home and relax. And I suppose then you know the summer's off again. It's not that they've the whole summer off and that they're not doing a bit of preparation. But it's that you know you're not bound nine to five. You know you don't have to be inside in off the ball at six in the morning, like you don't have to be... Well, just as we're talking, I'm sort of strongly considering a career change <laughs> because a nap at half three in the afternoon is, I think, exactly what I would require in most days. Um, talk to us a little bit just about the Cork team, Jamie, in terms of the demolition, obviously, in the semis last year and this Cork team. Like, looking at it, I looked at the that team and then the Munster final team by way of a sort of a rough um, comparison. It's not a huge amount of turnaround in terms of players. Like, there might be three players in, three, yeah. three players out. So, like, what is it, if anything, that's different that, uh, if you're a Cork fan, that's suggesting that they're going to beat Limerick this weekend? Um, I just think, look, I think the scoreline at the end of the semi-final last year was hugely flattering um, and to Watford and not, not in a... They deserve to win the game, absolutely, but I think, you know, it was slightly skewed by the fact that Damien Callan got a second jello and got sent off after, you know, I think there was only a point or two in the game at that stage. 
Um, you know, and in that last five, six minutes kind of garbage time as it's been called, Watford got a goal as well, you know, so that kind of put a bit of gloss on it that maybe wasn't there, whereas the game was probably maybe a three or four point victory for Watford. It was a Watford win all the same, mm-hmm. you know, and it always was, like, and I wouldn't, I'm certainly not saying that it wasn't deserved, but I think, you know, just the margin of the defeat was probably a small bit bigger than it, ev- than it ever really should have been in terms of what the gap between the two teams was. Um, different for Cork this year. I just think they're a year further down the tracks. I think, like you know, I I actually it's just one of the one of the quotes that stuck out in my mind was one of yours there about a month ago where I think Cork had burst onto the scene and start the Munster Championship and you were talking to Jar here and you just said it was today at the Tipperary game actually and you said um, oh my god I can't believe I forgot about all these good young Cork players at the at the, at half time. Yeah, we kind of discounted them. Yeah, and then you said oh my god I can't believe. Yeah, I forgot about all these good young Cork players and then at full time you said oh yeah I can't believe I forgot how young all these good Cork players were yeah. with that bit of inconsistency so I think like they're another year down the tracks yeah. you know I mean they've had a few more learning experiences this year in terms of that Tipperary game um, you know the slightly Jekyll and Hyde nature of that um, you know not closing out the game against Limerick with four t- against 14 and I think to be honest I think those are, are massive, are good things because I know a lot of this Cork team are 23, 24, 25, you know, which is quite young. A lot of them are 23, you know, are young guys and I think they're still learning the game and they're still learning how to win games and close out games, you know. Um, so I think, again, like I said, I think the, the main difference between this year's team and last year's team is while it is roughly the same team, it's a team that played last year and learned the lessons of last year, you know, like you know, touch wood, because um, I'm quite fond of him, like we played underage together, myself and Damien, but I don't think Damien's going to rush out again this year mm. and get caught with a sidestep and leave his hurley there to get sent off at a crucial stage of a game. That's a lesson you you hopefully only learn once, you know, mm. um, and things like that, you know, are, are kind of, you know, their chastening experiences, but they are massive learning experiences, I think, you know, for a young Cork team um, to have been through been through that, you know, and to have two monster championships on the back of it, um, and you know, to have had that experience of playing in a semi final in Croke Park last year, I think that would stand, stand them in yeah. very good stead. Like, there's, there's so many Sunday. interesting, so a lot of what you're saying, it strikes me, applies to Limerick as well, and yep. the trajectory that they're on. There's so many interesting stories about that, and whether the bank of uh, success that they've had at underage level stands to them at this level, yep. and you know, all that sort of stuff. So, with all that in the mix, what are you thinking? I'm probably leaning towards Limerick. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, I am leaning towards Limerick, and I just think no, it's not. It's not. No, it's not. It's not the cute Kerry tourism <laughs> coming over the border. It's yeah, just nothing wrong with that. I just no, there isn't. No, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with it. No, my two grandparents are well versed in it. No, giving it to us for years. They say, oh yeah, you, oh you'll beat us, you'll beat us. I'm kind of sick of listening to it, but um, we'll go out then and we lose by ten points <laughs> every time we go up to Croke Park. But um, no, um, I just I'm leaning towards Limerick. I, I don't know what it is. I just think um, I think you know their display down in Parky Cueve was really was really strong, and there was a lot of leaders came to the fore that day. I think today against Clare was just a, a kind of an anomaly in the sense that they were playing their third week in a row. They had kind of had the relief of qualifying out of Munster, and subconsciously I think that seeped in. And then when that game slightly got away from them, mm. you know it just it just fell away. It fell apart, kind of much in the same way that the Cork Waterford game got away from Cork and it just fell apart yeah. you know um, and I just think Limerick are just they just sli- have slightly more I think there's a couple of kind of I, I, I really would struggle to see any player in, on the Limerick team who I would say there's something to be targeted there whereas I think there are two or three kind of spots in the Cork team that I'm just a small bit concerned mm-hmm. about going into Sunday so a slight nod towards Limerick but you know, all right. I, I personally, the Limerick Galway final would be uh, would be pretty epic. I have to say, it's a game that I'd uh, I'd definitely be looking forward to. Um, Jamie, thanks a million for coming in. Thanks for really enjoy that. Jamie Wall, uh, all thoughts hurling ahead of this weekend.